Hey everybody, Kimberly here, and I'm super excited to share with you those games I played this past month. Yep, you guessed it, October. And not only that, I've got the top 10 favorite games that I played in order, but I've also included the games that I have in the house that I haven't played yet that I'm really looking forward to playing. And I want you to write in the comments of the games upcoming, which one do you really, really want to see a review of sooner than later because these games are gonna get played and I cannot wait to share my experience with you. So ranked in the order of my favorite to my most favorite, I have isolated two games from my list. So what that means is I am going to not be including Sagrada Artisans. I am still playing it. It is my last game and uh, I'm going to finish the campaign tomorrow and that means that my review for this will be coming out super soon and that is a no spoilers take on Sagrada Artisans the Legacy game. This game I've been really really enjoying and I cannot wait to share my full take of it with you but I have been playing this and I've been playing it every week since August? September? It's been a long time. There are a lot of games in here. So this one is not going to be as part of my list, but I have been playing the snot out of it. In addition to, and let's see if I can uh, drag it all the way over here. Ugh. Normally I don't do this because... Okay, uh, Kinfire Chronicles Night's Fall. Uh, I'm playing this as well, and it's been two and a half months I've been playing, and I probably am going to keep playing this game for the next two and a half months because I play once a week, and each scenario is 45 to 60 minutes, and there are 20-ish um, like missions that you can play in here, and so I'm about halfway through. This would top my list of the best game that I've played every week. And I know last month I talked about it. It topped the charts for both me and Lewis. This is just a dynamite game. It's a fantastic tabletop role-playing cooperative experience that has adventuring. It has fighting. It has uh, leveling up essentially in a very, very light way, a very easy and straightforward way. And I love the way that your deck uh, essentially builds as your character. All three of us play characters that are vastly different in gameplay, in personality, in everything. And so it just has a wonderful feel. So I've been playing this along with Sagrada Artisans in three player games. And so this again would be at the top of my list, but I am taking out those ongoing campaign legacy games from my list this month. But I am reminding you, I am still playing these and I'm having so much fun. So this one, I'm going to slide over here and I'm going to start my list. Um, this is my eighth favorite game that I played this last month. Oh, okay. Haha, -ha, keep it 100. Uh, this is a party game. And if you've played a game like Timeline, where you have to put things in order of when they happen in history, you will be able to jump into Keep It 100 just fine. And then the second half of it is Family Feud. What did everybody else say about this particular thing? So there's a question. For example, the question on the back of the box says, 100 people with teeth. Thinking about the past five years, have you brushed your teeth every single day without missing a day? And you have to slide that question into a timeline that has uh, a line of numbers in it. So is it between um, 15 and 25? Is it between 25 and 33? Is it between 33 and 87? Is it above 87? Is it lower than the first number 15? And you have to kind of squeeze it in and then everybody else is gonna bet on whether they think it's right, too high or too low. And then you flip the card over and there's a number on it. And if it fits the timeline, it stays. And then the timeline gets bigger. And of course, everything is out of one to 100. So the line is just numbers uh, from one to 100. And then you play out all the cards from your hand, depending on how many players you have. Fun, fun party game, really silly. Um, be ready for some maybe more adult theme questions in here, unless you want to sift through and pull those out ahead of time. Uh, and then they'll just be super, you know, family friendly, like, you know, teeth and, um, you know, stuff like that. So phobias and, and, and things that are just like very common to a, a group. Um, so this is Keep It 100, a game by Cut. All right, my next one uh, is a game by Heidelbear, 
and this is called Time Division. I really liked this game. Now, the cool thing about this is it's a two-player game, and you are playing cards um, in a draft in the beginning. You are drafting these cards, selecting a card for you, a card for your opponent, and then a card to go into the center pile. And at the end of drafting, you'll have six cards in your hand, and these cards are numbered, um, and they also have powers. And so, like, the lower the number, which means you're not going to maybe get as many victory points for it if you bank it, has a much better power than, let's say, the 10 card, which is a lot of points. It's 10 points, but, you know, compared to one point. And you are playing cards out on a tableau. Uh, one player goes first, and then the second player responds. And the player who has the higher number gets the power and chooses to either bank their own card or activate their own card and whichever thing they choose the opponent does the opposite so there's this really really cool interplay of well do i want my opponent to trigger their power so that i can get these big points or do i want to trigger my card and then have my opponent bank their points because my card actually is way more valuable as a trigger effect than as the points and maybe they're not going to earn as many points it's just a cool game. There's a set number of cards. You've got 18. There are three different decks, and they all have different cool upgrade abilities. This is cool. This is really fun. I found this to be a really dynamic game, and I had a great time with it. The quality is fantastic. The artwork is delightful and adorable, and I just think it's a solid two-player game that doesn't do the push-pull that I find to be so, you know, the tug of war that I find to be so meh in two player games. So Time Division is my number seven. Okay, my number seven is actually a game that I don't have with me because it was played at my um, faculty employee game night at my college and one of my friends brought it and it's called Campy Creatures. And this is a fun, silly game of having a similar deck of cards. So I get a deck um, and everyone else at the table gets the same deck of cards and all at the same time, simultaneously, you pick one card that you want to play and you put it face down. When everyone's ready, you flip your card over. And depending on what card you play, there might be a trigger effect or you might just have um, essentially the uh, highest value number to go. And what that means is you are going to be taking from the booty or the bounty that is in the center of the table. And sometimes there's not enough to go around. Sometimes there's too much. Sometimes there are bad things. Sometimes there are really great things. And really it's just this, what is my opponent going to play from their hand? What have they played already? What do, if I play this card, how does that affect everybody else and me? And what order am I going to go in if I play this? So it's kind of like one of those, guess what your opponent's going to do and then play the card you think is going to be the most effective because you want the cards that are out in the center. There are going to be these interim scorings um, whenever all the card, the deck gets run through essentially, and then you shuffle and then you, you know, add more cards and then you do it again. And so there are a couple rounds um, that allow you to catch up. Let's say if you fall behind in a round or two, it's a riot. It's a hoot. If you really like seeing, um, you know, stinky cards go to your uh, fellow players, if you like just a little bit of attack, a little bit of, uh, you know, gotcha, then this could be a lot of fun. This is that kind of game you play when you're sitting around with really close friends and you're just having a riot. I mean, it's fun. There is some strategy, but every time you could possibly pick the wrong card and you just have to roll with it. So campy creatures, Fun, silly, great with really good friends. So that's my number six. Now I'm going to move on to my number five, uh, which is not here as well. I was just looking for it and I'm like, I don't have it. So that one is going to be Last Light. Now, Last Light, I uh, was able to get a copy of, do a demo for, and I found it to be really satisfying. Now, it is that 4X game in one hour, maybe an hour and a half, but it is a short 4X game. And the way the game is accelerated, I've done a whole review on my channel uh, for this because I played it this month and I really wanted to talk about it. Um, it, it is just this really streamlined 4X where a lot of the movement is taken care of when everyone has played one of the cards from their hand, which is the refresh card. And when the refresh card is triggered because players are picking a card simultaneously, playing it, doing an action. Super, super easy turns. But once everyone's played that refresh card, 
Now you have this refresh face and the board starts moving in these uh, circles. There's a center circle, a middle circle, and then there's the board itself. And then if you're on those circles that move, you start moving as well. And so it really accelerates the movement, that kind of exploration in that 4X game um, in a really nice streamlined, easy, and anticipated way, which I kind of like. The cards are super easy and straightforward. There are only six of them and you do all of your turns simultaneously. So everything is just super, super easy, super straightforward. It is very conflict ridden. It's very uh, player, player interaction. So if that's not something you're into, be wary of that. Last Light absolutely requires that you engage with fellow players on the table you know, for sure. So if that, if that sounds meh, then like, you know, maybe, maybe look at it again and, you know, take a look at some other people's reviews and stuff, but it was fun. It was fast. It was light. It was easy to get into. If anybody wants to play a 4X game or they want to know what that's like, I think Last Light is a great first step into that. Um, and it's also just enjoyable for uh, strategy gamers, for, uh, you know, heavy gamers or experienced gamers as well. Because I've played big games, big 4X games, like, you know, four or five hour games. And then to distill it down into one, one and a half hours, wow. I mean, really, really cool. So that was my number five. And I'm going to go to my number four. This is Beer and Bread. Beer and Bread is a two player game. And I really liked how multifunctional the cards were in this game uh, and how resources work with this known quantity of resources that are out in the center. And those are the resources that players are going to vie for. But they also have cards that they want to build and they have two different types of cards. And the way that this is um, um, not voted, not judged, uh, not graded, um, scored. Gosh, I was like, it's all those things. The way that you score at the end of this game is by looking at the amount of beer cards uh, versus bread cards. And you're going to count that lowest one. So you really want to make sure that you're building your beer cards and your bread cards at about the same pace. It kind of reminds me of... Um, um, uh, Reiner Knizia, even though Scott Alms is the designer here, it's got that Reiner Knizia, always make sure you're paying attention to the lowest value of whatever track you have. And in this game, it's just two tracks. Your, your, your beer breads, your card breads, uh, beer breads and your, <laughs> your beer cards and your bread cards. I'm talking too fast. Um, but it's got this lovely Euro feel and look to it. Um, the qualities here, the the, the 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 strategy is here it's actually really really quite good and 30 to 45 minutes per game i think this is probably one of the strongest two player games that i have played in um in a while i think it's just really lovely i mean specifically designed for two players and there is that um keeping an eye on your opponent, making sure that what they've got is uh, hopefully not what you need. Uh, and there's this wonderful kind of overflow of resources that if your opponent's taking too many, they actually go to you. And I think that's a really cool um, rule. It's a really cool mechanic. So a lot to really like in beer and bread. Okay, that was my number four. I'm moving on to my number three. This game I did a run through for over at Rado's channel, Satori. Just a nice, nice strategy game uh, for one to four players, and it takes about half an hour per person to play. This is all about worker placement, but they are shared workers. So when it's your turn to go, you're gonna look down in this bottom space where there are three different colored workers there, and they're going to go out and do your bidding out on the board, but the color that you pick is going to be a worker to do one job. But if that color matches the space you're going, you get to do two things, not just one thing. So the color you pick is really important, especially if you know your opponents want something else that you see is available, but you get to go first. There is a great way to go and get first place in this game whenever you want to, for the next round, be the first player. So you get that first player marker. Really, really cool. I like that. Um, otherwise, it just stays with the same person. And going first is pretty important because you want to get to a place, but there is no blocking. Much like a lot of worker placements, if you go to a place that's either devalued or it's not available to you, well, in this game, you can go. You can go to the same place. If I take a purple worshiper and I put them in the space that has like a purple symbol, then I get it and I get two sides of it, which let me do all these cool actions. 
well, you can go and do the same thing. It's not full. And I like that. I like that a lot. So there are a lot of things that you're doing in Satori. It is a heavier game. I'm not, not heavy, but it's medium level. Some of the, the games I've been talking about so far are kind of light party games, two player strategies that take half an hour total. This is about half an hour per person to play. So you've got to think of a lot of things um, when you're doing this, but there's a really great way that uh, the sky works, the mountains work essentially, praying and meditating up in the mountains. Um, and then of course you've got your own resources. So you've got that resource management and you're just constantly building victory points along the way. And you've got that end game scoring too. So I think Satori is satisfying. I think it's beautiful. I think it's a, it's a table hog. Um, but I, I really do like this. And the more I played it, the more I just saw the strategy and I refined that early game that just made me really, really uh, powerful in the game, uh, strategically speaking. Okay, that was Satori. Next, I've got, ugh, this is my number two. This is the Artemis Odyssey. I returned to this after playing it when I first got it in my Kickstarter backing um, a little while back. And I think this has just some really fantastic mechanics. Um, so the first one is that players are taking cards that they have in their hands. These are going to be the actions that they want to trigger. And in turn order, players are going to take a card and they're going to put it in a line of low to high, meaning this is going to be the first card that triggers in the whole round and everybody gets to do that action. Then the next card is the second card, then the third card, then the fourth card, then the fifth card. So player turn order, I pit, take one card and I put it in the very first spot, meaning this is the first action that we all will do. Well, then the player to my left goes and they take their card and they put it in the very last spot, meaning they want to make sure that this is the last action that we all do because they're setting themselves up for some kind of really cool turn. And then we just keep going in circle and turn order and we are setting the round for the actions that we want to do. And then when it's done, we flip over the card and then we all do that action, whatever it is. Let's gather resources on the planets that have this symbol on it. And then we all gather our resources. Um, let's explore and we're going to move our spaceships out into other places. So there's a there's this whole like exploration and planet zone where you are going to go and build different uh, kind of like buildings or refineries to kind of get the resources and to have that ownership. Um, there's going to be that movement and the resources. Um, then there are other cards that you use to score based on what your very immediate current status is that exact time. So the timing of these cards and placing them out in that timeline for the round is super, super important. And you essentially play the game until you cross the victory point trigger. And so there are no set number of rounds. It's just simply when a player is going to cross that line and then whoever crosses the line furthest at the end of that whole round will be declared the winner. It's got this really fascinating interplay of your personal strategy, people getting in your way, but you trying to set things up and maybe get in their way, the exploration, the player interaction. I mean, this this is just a really great follow-up because I played the previous Artemis, the Artemis project, I think it was, and this is so different. It is so different. Like, I thought they were going to be similar, and I do like that there's space and they're about refining, you know, resources and whatnot. But this had such a vastly different feel, and I just wasn't expecting it. So um, I, I just really, really like it. I like, I just like the opportunities. I love the alien tech. I love, I, I love, I love the things about it. It's just really fun. It's really cool. There's just enough choice, but there's that player interaction that just kind of makes things just a little bit in flux. So it's one of five players. Um, 45 minutes total, maybe 45 minutes to an hour. I think it took us a little bit longer the first time playing it, but second time we knew what we were doing. So um, this was just a, a really great strategy. I think it plays well with um, maybe three or four players. Um, I haven't played solo, so I'm not sure how that works, but it, you know, the, the cards and playing the cards out is really where it's at. Um, so yeah, nice, nice success, nice win there with the Artemis Odyssey. 
And then lastly, oh, I have to reach really far. Um, I uh, got a copy, a preview copy of Nocturne, which is Flat Out Games' new game, and uh, it's uh, Kickstarter as we speak, I believe. I will double check and put that uh, link in the description below so you can go and check it out. If you're not familiar with Flat Out Games, they are doing some dynamite things. I've got Point City, I've got Deep Dive, I've got um, Cascadia, I've also got um, Calico. There are just some wonderful games that they're putting out and Nocturne fits in with that. 30 to 45 minutes per game, one to four players, and I think the cool thing about this is it really offers players full information. I mean, there is a place where you're going to possibly receive tiles. There's a lot of set collection here in this game, um, but there's a place to maybe receive tiles at the end of the round, which there are two of, and then there's the big grid in the center of the board, depending on how many players you have. And players have these same chips, these little discs with their color and then a number on it. And the first player is going to put their two out on any tile that they want to bid on. They essentially are saying, I want to win this with a two. But it doesn't stop there because, of course, no one's going to let somebody else win with a two. They then, in turn order, have to raise the stakes. They have to play a higher disc of any value on an orthogonal space to that initial bid. And it will be this snake bidding um, where you bid always next to the most recently played tile. And if you get two passes all the way around and it gets back to you, then you win that tile. You turn your disc over, take the tile, and you leave your disc. And you take the tile and add it to your collection. Everybody else who didn't win the bid has a chance to send one of their bid discs to the fairies. And that's where those other tiles are that you might win at the end of the round. So this, this, this open information bidding with the snake, um, really dynamite. I mean, it is just like a cool mechanic that they haven't done before that I really, really like. We're familiar with set collection. I mean, Sushi Go did set collection with the same numbers and the same kinds of things that you see here. So that's going to be pretty familiar to you. But one thing that um, Richard at, at Rado's channel and I talked about in our final thoughts, because we both did run-throughs for this together. He did the first half of the game and I did the second half. He talked about how it reminded him of Goa. And it reminded me of a game I just did a preview for last year called Sky Rise. I think it's Sky Rise. Let me check. Yes, it's Sky Rise. I just wanted to make sure I get it right because I really liked it. And it had this four region cloud city where you would bid with these buildings that had a unique number on them and you would do that chain um snake bidding of raising the stakes raising 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 and where you ended you got that thing and then everything else came off the board um and i liked that so much and so did lewis we had a really really good time with that and here you get something similar to that. Now there are special uh, character cards in here. It's endlessly replayable with the combination of tiles and how it works with the discs. There's this fantastic upgrading of discs into really cool, unique colors. Um, there are public objectives, there are private objectives. It just is a nice, nice balance and fits so well into what Fit uh, Flat Out Games, oh, and Fit to Print too, Flat Out Games is doing. I really like it. I have all their games. I do. I have all their games. They're all over here. Um, they're games that I share. They're games that I play. I think this is easier to get than Calico. I think Calico is one of those more challenging um, on the scale of complexity when it comes to keeping a lot going in your mind at the same time you're doing your own puzzle in Calico. I think Nocturne is just a really cool game and I think it works especially well with two players. So this is going to top my list for uh, the favoritest game <laughs> that I played in the month of October. Okay, so now is the time for you to really pay attention and tell me which game you want to see a review of sooner rather than later. So these are the games that I have. You're going to see that a lot of them are still shrink wrapped because I got them and I haven't had a chance to open and read the rules for them. Some of them I have played before, but I haven't uh, necessarily shared with you a uh, full take. So these games came. Um, I am a huge fan of Dr. Steve Finn. 
and Alpujaras uh, was a game that I did a full run through, or it, you know, mostly I did I did enough turns to teach you how to play the game. And then Fisheries of Gloucester. These are games I can do a specific review over. Maybe you want to see them put paired side by side. Maybe do a comparison. Uh, Fisheries is a two-player, 45-minute game, while Alpujaras is a one-to-four player game, 30 minutes a player. This is a this is one of the heavier strategy games I've uh, played of his. Um, really enjoy that turn order time track in Alpujaras a lot. So these are two. I'm going to slide them over here. We're going to keep everything just kind of barely visible so you can always know what's going on. Um, my island uh, is opened because we are going to jump into this once we finish Sagrada Artisans, which, like I said, I am one game from finishing. Um, this is just like My City, uh, which is that ongoing legacy campaign game. Uh, they have secret envelopes and all cool stuff. And in this game, you are placing these um, various sized hex tiles onto an island and hopefully scoring uh, big, big points. So my island is coming up, but I will prioritize it if you want me to. Next thing is <laughs> Scholars of the South Tigris. Um, I <laughs> yes, um, I am a huge fan. I've got the all the ones up here. I've got the um, West Kingdoms. I've got all the um, South Tigris. I've got the these guys. These are all like in those lovely little trilogies. So I, I will play this one and uh, again, prioritize it if you want. So this guy goes here, we're going to put that there. Um, Return to Dark Tower Covenant. Uh, this is an expansion to Return to Dark Tower. Um, we'll get on my channel sooner if you want. Vote for it, please. Uh, I like this because it's got that cooperative feel and the games take between an hour and two hours and I'm really excited to see what Covenant offers as that extra play for uh, Return to Dark Tower. Super excited about this. Okay, um, next thing is I got this in a Kickstarter. It's called Run, and it's a two-player, 20-minute game of secret hidden movement with one player while the other player is looking for them. It looks so fun. It's one reason why I backed it. Um, I also really enjoy those uh, two-player games that are designed um, just for two players so that Lewis and I can get it on the table. I've got another two player coming up, but remember beer and bread and I also had time division from this last month that I enjoyed that I, I really liked playing uh, simply as a two player. So action packed game of hide and seek run. Here's the other one. This is called The Hunt, a brand new game out by 25th Century Games. Um, they call it a tense and exciting naval duel because one person is hidden and they are uh, essentially wanting to stay hidden from uh, the opponent and the opponent is trying to find them uh, and of course destroy them. So this is a uh, nice, how long, how long do they say here? They don't say, oh, 20 to 40 minutes. So uh, I think I'm going to hopefully enjoy this. I have opened it up, I've read the rules, um, but we'll see uh, how that how that ends up. And then lastly, still shrinked, unfortunately. I am super excited about Empire's End. Um, give me a, a John D. Clare game any day of the week. Um, so this is a maybe m modest or moderate uh, Civ game. I'm, I'm really looking forward to this. Two to four players and then that nice hour strategy game. There's a lot to like here. It's gonna be super fun with that sieve theme. I mean, I just think I'm gonna be building a sieve, running into disasters, watching my opponent's civilizations <laughs> go down in a ball of glory. I don't know. Um, it'll be it'll be really, really exciting. Um, there's also this uh, reverse bidding mechanism that I'm really, really excited about. I haven't seen too many places. Um, so this is the other one. So. These are the games that I have. I'm gonna pull these guys back out again. Aha, aha, aha. So if you are interested in wanting to see um, some faster review um, of these games, put it in the uh, comments below. I can't wait to hear what you think and uh, what you've been playing this month as well. So feel free to share those games that you're really excited about that you got on the table and you're like, I can't wait to get them back out on the table again. All right, everybody, I will see you later. Bye.